spectacular. Uh, we have trapped and released cutthroats uh, up to 27 inches in length out of that lake. You never used to catch a cutthroat that big out of Yellowstone Lake, or very, very rarely. The cookie cutter cutthroat in Yellowstone Lake used to be 13 to 18. Um, these are old fish that are left <coughs> in that system. They're also probably too big for those lake trout to eat. That's why they're still alive. This is where all the gill nets were set. This happens to be from 2007. Uh, every dot on this map represents a set of nets, of gill nets. The darker red or orange that dot is, the more efficient it was at catching lake trout. So a white dot didn't have any lake trout catch per unit effort. As we got up to the dark red dots, they were between 8 and 80 lake trout per unit effort. You can see the vast majority of their nets in 2007 at least were set around the west thumb and out through the channel going into the main body of the lake. But clearly they did go around the rest of the lake and sat, uh, set some gill nets, but most of their effort was focused on the west thumb. They did that because the majority of their success was on the west thumb. But not all of it, because even if you look way down here in the arms, there's some dark red dots down there. Very few dots at all, but a couple of them are dark red. So there are lake trout, lake trout throughout the lake. But again, this is a huge lake. It's a huge lake. To get down into these arms, first of all, that's a no-wake zone. But it takes a long time for their boats to get down there. This is the lake trout removal on Yellowstone Lake. And I realize I'm kind of painting a dim picture here. And I hope before I'm done I can lift your spirits a little bit. That it's not perhaps as bad as it all seems. Um, this is from back in 1994. Originally they caught um, lake trout by the dozens, then by the hundreds, then by the thousands, then by the tens of thousands, until this year they had an all-time high of 220,000 lake trout were caught in their nets. It's a result of more effort, more nets in the water, uh, four boats out on the water, but also probably more lake trout in the system. Um, there's a principle of fisheries that Kevin could explain to us. I've, I don't profess to be a fisheries biologist, but it says that if you remove one half of the adult population of any fish species in any given year, and you continue that process for multiple years, you can drive that population into severe decline. They've done it in the oceans with sport fish. So certainly it can happen in Yellowstone Lake. The good thing about this is the scientists again believe that we are at that threshold right here. They believe that the population of lake trout in that system is somewhere around 300 to 400,000 adult lake trout. That doesn't include the young of the year. So we are at that 50% give or take. We're pretty close right now. But here's the real problem, and one that is going to be, has to be addressed, because through netting you will never remove the last two lake trout. I don't care how good you are, <laughs> you're never going to remove the last two, especially not in a system that large. If you've got a little farm pond, yeah, you can maybe get them all out, but not in Yellowstone Lake. But the problem is every female lake trout is capable of laying hundreds, if not thousands of eggs. This is a female lake trout caught in gill net. Uh, I wouldn't say she's typical, but I also wouldn't say that she's atypical either. Because when she was cut open, those are the eggs that spilled out of her. So you have to be able to cut off that recruitment into the population. And that leads us to additional lake trout suppression methods. Is gill netting, trap netting, Netting of any kind, the only solution? No. There are other solutions, but most of them have not really been developed um, to the point where they can be applied in, in this large a scale. But you've got to kill the eggs. You've got to cut off the recruitment into the population if you're really going to control lake trout in this lake or any other lake. And by the way, there are a number <coughs> of other lakes that have lake trout problems that they're fighting right now. 
lakes like Ponderay, lakes like Lake McDonald up in Glacier Lake, Quartz Lake up in Glacier National Park. Uh, there are several in Colorado. Uh, there are others here in Wyoming. Swan Lake over in Montana. Fortunately, or I, I guess it's a good thing, lake trout are swarm spawners. Uh, cutthroat, when they go up the tributaries to spawn, you've all seen it. Just like rainbows, they pair up. Dig a red, deposit the eggs, male comes along, fertilizes them. They're very possessive about that red. You might have a couple of spawning pair in a red. Um, but lake trout uh, spawn in swarms of hundreds to even thousands and perhaps even more. Uh, a fish orgy, if you will. Okay. Lake trout spawn fairly shallow. Uh, most people believe it's typically less than 20 foot deep in the water. It can be as, as shallow as three or four feet. Uh, they sh uh, spawn in the lake in the fall where cutthroats spawn up the tributaries in the spring. So we've got a separation between lake trout and cutthroat trout in time and in space. So if we had a way to somehow kill the eggs of these swarm spawners in shallow areas of the lake in the fall, we wouldn't be harming the cutthroats. Well, there are some techniques that have been looked at both uh, in the literature and also are being studied right now up at Montana State University. Some of them seem a little bit uh, kind of far-fetched, but all of them have been demonstrated as at least working. If not, uh, uh, there's some scale up on some of them. You know, you, very simply, you could vacuum them off the spawning grounds if you had a big enough vacuum system. And actually, there are some big vacuum systems that are used to clean silt off of uh, stream spawning areas. Uh, you can use an electrical field. Actually, it's known that uh, DC at about 450 volts, if you drive the cathode down into the substrate and turn your voltage up, you can kill the eggs. It's actually been a bit of a problem in, in normal fisheries, you know, making sure you don't kill eggs, don't turn that voltage too high. But you can kill them. Actually, over on uh, uh, Swan Lake, they actually did this this last fall. You can use sediment or a biodegradable polymer to smother those eggs. Actually, that's a, a problem in most fish hatcheries. You want to make sure you don't have sediment when you're trying to hatch those eggs. You can use a high-intensity ultrasound to shatter the membranes on those eggs. You can use high-intensity UV light to kill the eggs. You can use microwaves to shatter the eggs. You can use carbon dioxide to smother them. Again, all of these have been looked at in the laboratory. Um, it's now time to take them up to large scale. Well, this is a research effort, actually, that was proposed back in uh, 2006 by Dr. Robert Gresswell of the USGS up in Bozeman, Montana. Um, he spent most of his career out on Yellowstone Lake as a fisheries biologist, then was hired into the USGS to do research. And, and he wanted to explore all these other ideas, but uh, uh, actually he had some partners joining Montana State, Dr. Molly Webb, who's with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They all said, yeah, let's, let's get together on this and get a research program going. Um, they didn't have any money. They, they came up with about 30,000. Uh, the Cody chapter of TU over in, uh, in Cody um, kind of took it up as a cause and, and said uh, we'll help raise the money and they formed what's called the Save the Yellowstone Cutthroat Campaign. And that campaign was started in January of 2008 with a committee of four from the East Yellowstone chapter, a group of people just like you who said there's got to be a better way. There has got to be something we can do about this. They said, we're, we're going to raise the money for you, Bob Gresswell. We're going to make sure you've got the money to explore these other techniques. Their priority was to raise some private funds first. Um, that was to show the commitment by the conservation groups they were then going to approach the government agencies, shame them, if you will, into putting some money into it. Uh, they always believed that a science-based approach was, was the way to tackle this, and that public awareness was, was always going to be key. And uh, a, a little over a year ago, 
about a year and a half ago now, Superintendent Daniel Wink was hired into Yellowstone National Park. If you haven't met him, um, if you're in the park and have an opportunity to meet him, thank him for what he has done because he brought this problem right to the top of the natural resources issues in the park. A little over a year ago, they developed a native fisheries conservation EA with specific goals, and that was always one of the problems. They were doing a lot of netting, but they never knew what the goal was. Where, where are we trying to go with all this netting? What's the end result? How are we going to achieve success? How do we define success? And uh, they did that a year ago. Major effort. They, as I pointed out, they added commercial netters. They're scaling up those commercial netters. The Hickey Brothers will have their two boats up there all summer, this summer. It's not cheap. Um, they have identified some of the spawning sites. And do any of you know where Carrington Island is? You know where Carrington is? Carrington Island is the best known lake trout spawning site in that lake. If you want to go kill lake trout on the lake, Go to Carrington Island the end of September, first part of October, and just slay the crap out of them. You can haul them out of there by the thousands. Okay. If there's another one across the West Thumb, which um, somewhere I've got a map that shows where it is. They know where some of these are. Um, you know, they they do uh, or have done some great work on identifying some of those spawning sites. By the way, that spawning site at Carrington Island probably isn't any bigger than the middle of this table. Yet thousands spawn on it. That's how small it is. It's incredibly small. Um, they reconvened the science review panel last summer, which was a major impact. The science review panel is a group of, uh, I believe there are 14 well-known, renowned scientists in fisheries from around the country who get together, uh, got together first in 2008, got back together this summer, and gave direction to the Park Service. They applied for the Yellowstone Park Foundation for a million dollars annually to support their netting operation because they simply didn't have the budget to scale up that netting anymore. And they've also agreed to a memo of understanding with uh, quite a few of us as NGOs, non-governmental organizations, Trout Unlimited, Greater Yellowstone Coalition, National Parks Conservation Association. We've got a, a group of NGOs who normally don't agree on very much, but we agree on this one, that we've got to be able to solve this problem. Um, normally, I don't, I don't sit down with GYC on a regular basis, okay? Uh, I disagree with some of their positions. I'm sure they disagree with some of ours as well. But we agree on this one, and, and we're entering into an MOU with the Park Service. And this is the most important, um, I believe, development in the last 15 years of this problem. Last summer, August 2011, with USGS heading up the research effort, the Park Service initiated a telemetry study to identify the spawning sites and the movement patterns. And I want to talk about that telemetry study. Uh, again, its purpose is to monitor how these lake trout move and where they spawn. Because if you know how they move, you know where to set your nets. And if you know where they spawn, you know how to go in and target them. And there could be as few as eight or ten or a dozen, we don't know, spawning areas in that lake. Even as big as that lake is, it takes a specific type, type of uh, substrate for them to spawn on. Last August, they implanted hydroacoustic tags. This is a hydroacoustic tag. I'm going to pass it around. Uh, it's a little different than the telemetry tags you're using here on the wind for the adopted trout study. This tag can be picked up at tremendous depths. Normal telemetry tags have a range of, what, 15, 20 feet deep in the water, and you lose a signal. You can't get it. They can get this tag clear down at that 300-foot depth. Okay? They can pick it up at a long range, half a kilometer. 500 meters from a receiver, they can pick up this tag. However, they're expensive. This tag right here is 400 bucks. Okay, I'm going to pass it around. It, this is still a functioning hydroacoustic tag. It was implanted into a lake trout last summer. They subsequently netted that lake trout, harvested the tag back out of it. They're going to re-implant this tag this coming spring. 
I want this back. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that disappears, somebody owes me 400 bucks. <laughs> okay. Um, these are just a sonar tag. They send off a ping like sonar. They're picked up by a receiver, and I'll talk more about it in a minute. They have fixed location receivers around the lake. It's not an antenna like we do our normal telemetry studies trying to find fish in streams and rivers. These receivers are fixed in the lake. They're weighted down by an anchor at the bottom of the lake with a rope to the receiver, another rope to a buoy up on the surface of the water. Uh, these receivers are about the size of a, uh, oh, a, a propane cylinder, if you will. They're probably three inches in diameter and 12 inches long. Okay? And I'll show you uh, some pictures of some of this. Again, it was initiated August 16th, 2011, 141 of those. You can do the math, 141 of those at 400 bucks a piece, that's $56,000. 40 receivers, the receivers are 1400 bucks a piece. That's another $56,000. They also have a mobile receiver. Once they uh, feel that there are lake trout congregating in a particular area and spawning, they can go in with a mobile receiver and pinpoint that area much better. They download the data off these receivers every two weeks. These are not satellite based. You can get satellite based tags. I don't know what they cost, but they're a lot more than 400 bucks to do that. So you actually have to go out to the receivers and download the data every two weeks and then analyze it. Uh, again, the Cody chapter stepped up. They bought the first 73 tags at 27,000. Uh, we kind of embarrassed the Park Service, I think, because they immediately came up with 25,000 more to buy the rest. Um, supplies for the study were paid for by Trout Unlimited here in Wyoming, Montana, the Greater Yellowstone Coalition, and the National Parks Conservation Association. Everybody pitched in. The National Park Service and the USGS provided the receivers, the researchers, and all the other costs, which amounted to literally hundreds of thousands of dollars. This is what the surgery looks like, much like uh, surgery on a standard uh, telemetry tag. Make a, a small slit in the lake trout, insert the tag, stitch it back up when you're done. And up here at the top is, is the wound. These are fish recovering from the anesthesia that's used. And then they are actually releasing those lake trout back out into the lake so that they, their movements can be monitored. This is actually the location of the first 40 receivers that were placed out in the lake. Every one of these red triangles is a receiver location. The yellow circle around it is the listening range. Again, they have a listening radii of about half a kilometer. So you can see the strategy here. They put up what are called curtains so that if a lake trout swims from the west thumb out into the main body of the lake, he's going to be picked up here because there's overlap of the listening <coughs> radius, here, here, and if he comes down this way, here, here, and here. So they set up curtains where they can follow the movement. But you can also <coughs> see there are huge blind spots out in this lake where if a lake trout is out in here swimming around, you don't see him. You don't know where he's at. Bottom line is 40 receivers is not enough. We need more coverage than that. But again, they're 1,400 bucks a piece. By the way, 141 tags is not enough either. Statisticians will tell you that if you're really going to get good uh, statistics on movement patterns, you need more than 141 fish in a system this large. Um, this is the next 12 receivers that are going to go in this spring. These receivers. Uh, are already on board. We've we've got those.